This is Nike Park in Addison, Illinois. It's a public park with a strange pillar near the playground, encased in a fence so that it can be a part of the kids' fun too. To an outsider, it looks like a weird but perfectly acceptable part of the playground, with a little perch for kids to get a bird's eye view of the surroundings. However, as it turns out, this is only one of the many Cold War missile bases that were intentionally wiped off the face of the earth only to be converted into a playground for children. So join me to find out why, as today we discover the history of Nike bases that were converted into parks. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. The story of the Nike Park begins with the Project Nike, the program that yielded the United States' first anti-aircraft missile system and the world's first guided surface-to-air missile. You see, towards the end of the Second World War, as aircraft became faster and flew higher and could go further than ever before, typical air defense systems were suddenly woefully outdated. Even the best anti-aircraft artillery weapons were limited when engaging with emerging jet aircraft. The first progress on this was made before the war even ended. In the fall of 1944, an engineer from Bell Telephone Laboratories at Frankfurt Arsenal pitched an idea for an automated projectile that could launch and intercept any approaching planes faster and higher than it could ever possibly match, and then destroy the plane. After investigations brought the fledging idea into the next year, the U.S. Army Ordnance asked Bell Laboratories and its then-parent company, Western Electric, to produce recommendations for a development program. They also brought this request to General Electric, who created a separate program that yielded separate conclusions. The result, in 1954, was the world's first surface-to-air missile, the Nike Ajax, 20 feet long, one foot in diameter with two steering fins and weighing just under half a ton, the missile itself is mostly comprised of electronics. At the beginning of the launch, its ascent is powered by a booster rocket half its length, which brings it to supersonic speeds before detaching. This occurs once the missile shoots straight up into the air, and then the booster detaches. The missile contacts the equipment at the launch site, Comprised of a series of three radars, computers, and automatic plotting boards, all with the independent power generators. Those are the components of a Nike base. One of the radars is the acquisition radar, which scans its area of coverage to detect aircraft. A second radar, the target radar, takes the acquired target and tracks it, maintaining the location of the target. The third radar, the missile radar, focuses on the Nike missile itself in the launching rack and follows it as it takes off. The information from these radars is fed into the control computer, which makes calculations on the exact path the missile should take to arrive at the projected location of the target, as well as accounting for the evasive actions taken by the plane. Once making contact with the target, the warhead at the tip of the missile detonates, bringing an end to the threat. Surprisingly for the era, all these calculations were done automatically through an entirely portable system. The missile knows where it is at all times, as well as where the target is and how to get there. While Project Nike was created for use in the Second World War, it was in a conflict where everyone hoped it wouldn't need to be used. With the expansion of the Soviet Union's influence deep into Europe and the solidification of that influence by way of nuclear weaponry, the United States adopted a policy of containment, relying heavily on strategic air power and nuclear weapons to deter further Soviet aggression. The goal here was to clarify that any first strike would be followed up by a much greater counterattack, making any attack simply not worth it. This doctrine of massive retaliation in the event of an attack formed the basis of a policy of mutually assured destruction, or MAD. After intelligence came in about the Soviet's intercontinental ballistic missile program and its startling progress, several American missile programs went up to match and surpass theirs. Alongside these programs, the Army commissioned Bell Labs again to create a new Nike variant specifically for taking down ICBMs, which culminated in the Nike Hercules in 1958. And then of course the Nike Zeus, which, while successful, never saw deployment. 
However, by the mid-1960s, the increased Soviet focus on ICBMs caused the U.S. to respond by lowering the number of Nike batteries since the Soviets focused on taking down aircraft first and missiles second. Later developments saw Nike bases constructed underground, so dismantling batteries was not as simple as moving the radars and computers elsewhere. Regardless, Nike missile systems were used consistently in the U.S. defense plans until the mid-1970s, when most of them left the Army's arsenal. While Nike missiles remained relevant in other nations' arsenals into the 1990s, the U.S. was largely done with the project, having moved on to other defense methods, such as Sentinel and Safeguard. However, that left hundreds of Nike missile bases languishing around the country, while everyone around them asked the same question, what now? And it's here that we shift our focus back to Addison, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. 1973 saw the deactivation of the Nike project, and a controversy began around the bases later that year. Several areas in and around Chicago housed Nike missile bases and radar systems, and the Army planned to hold onto them for the Army Reserve. But given that there were several in question, each of which was anywhere from 40 to 90 acres of land, several community groups had asked for the land to be given to local governments to be turned into parks and other recreational areas. This wasn't unprecedented, as the parks had gotten 13 acres in Arlington Heights the year the program ended. With the missiles being removed, the public didn't see any point in the army sticking around in their backyards, and Arlington Heights became the center of this debate. This eventually escalated into a larger controversy, as communities didn't want to have this perfectly arable land be turned into a military base. Eventually, representatives of the Arlington Heights Park District, one of the many areas with a base, met with Army officials in Washington, D.C. to discuss the area's future. However, the Army didn't budge. Once word came out about this decision in June, residents of the affected areas came together to protest the Army's appropriation of the land, but the Army pressed on with their stance regardless. Protests continued, pamphlets were distributed, and cars with bumper stickers protesting the site's use started driving around. But still, the army didn't budge. This is rather understandable considering the paranoid nature of the Cold War. Perhaps the government still feared the potential for information leaks, should any relics be left behind. This is actually a major possibility. Not to get too sidetracked here, but according to Duke, even in modern day, there have been weird incidences of data brokers selling information related to U.S. military personnel. And to be fair, data privacy is something we can all relate to. I'm no better. In fact, when I first started this channel, I made my personal email address available, leading to an insane level of privacy invasion by scammers, spammers, and all the rest of it. But in a way, this was a great learning experience as it brought a new awareness of just how big my digital footprint really is. This is an issue most of us can probably relate to, but thanks to our sponsor, Delete Me, you now have the power to remove your personal data that is exposed online. Delete Me is a fantastic service that will erase your personal data from people search websites. I'm talking about hundreds of data brokers selling your information. And it's an ongoing process. Once they clean house, they'll keep scanning for new data that shows up so they can remove that also. Thanks to Delete Me, I could remove old listings containing my vital records like former addresses, professional background, and even family photos. Now with Delete Me's ongoing monitoring, I feel confident that I can continue enjoying the privacy everyone deserves. I'd encourage you to do the same. So if you want to get your personal information removed from search results on the web, go to joindeleteme.com slash SoCash. Delete Me is offering 20% off their privacy plans to all my viewers with code SOCASH. Again, that's joindeleteme.com slash SOCASH, promo code SOCASH. Things changed on September the 26th when President Ford officially announced the transfer of 52 acres of the Arlington Heights Nike base to the Park District under the Federal Legacy of Parks program. The Army was to keep 71 acres for the Reserve Training Center, but it seemed a compromise had finally been reached. However, the public still wasn't satisfied. 
picketing continued into the next year, with antagonizers threatening to invoke imagery of the American Revolution, should the issue continue into 1976, the 200th anniversary of the United States. The protest continued, and the situation further worsened. That was until Army Secretary Howard H. Colloway resigned to head President Ford's 1976 election campaign. Initially, the parks were pessimistic about the coming change in staff, expecting equal or heightened resistance to public use. But what actually ended up happening here couldn't have been further from that pessimistic outlook. With the change in management, the Army sent a message to the Park District in July that their requests were now being favorably considered, and that they could use the area for a Harvest Day festival as early as August. You see, this became possible because the Army could give away the area through a, quote, revocable license for an indefinite period. That way, the public could have the park, but if the need arose, the Army could move back into the base and staff it how they see fit. After this, the controversy largely died down, and these days there's a golf course, a public park, and a reserve command base at the Arlington Heights location. And so it was. The compromise that paved the way for Addison's Nike Park had been achieved. Unlike Arlington Heights, the entirety of the Addison Nike base was handed over to the public. A dedication ceremony took place in December of 1975, transferring the deed for 26 acres that made up the park from the Army to the Park District, and for recreational use. As a part of the ceremony, a plaque commemorating the Army's role in the community was unveiled, as well as the shell of a Nike missile. The ceremony was a joint effort between the community and the Army, finally putting the issue to bed. To this day, the only remnants of the base are the control building and the single radar tower, which, as we saw at the top of the video, had been creatively integrated into the playground. The launch site the radar served was redeveloped into the headquarters of the Addison Park District, leaving no remnants aside from a fence line and a van pad. And as it turns out, Nike bases becoming parks is not uncommon. Since they were relatively small as far as missile bases go, it was not difficult to move them out of the way especially since the earlier Nike models were portable. Other examples include the site that the areas in Addison and Arlington Heights served. Between Chicago and Gary, Indiana, there were launch sites as well as radars, but in most cases, all evidence of the sites were completely removed, except some pipes and broken chunks of concrete by 1963, with one that stayed in use until 1974, the land was later developed into various things, such as green spaces, open prairies, and sport parks. But with that being said, some launch silos can still be seen. A Nike base operated in Pacific, Missouri, just outside of St. Louis, from 1960 to 1968. After its closure, the land was mostly redeveloped, with some buildings remaining. In particular, former troop barracks are now used by the Nike Elementary School, with the former launch site itself serving as a bus parking lot for the kids. The main area is intact, with some buildings still standing. Project Nike was the progenitor of all surface-to-air missiles, the first to ever produce something that could hit a jet plane from the ground, as well as go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an intercontinental ballistic missile. Yet, for all of this, the sites that once made up the Nike defense array are now mostly anything from scarce to non-existence, be they parks, land developments for other uses, or just returned to wildlife entirely. In most cases, you have to have a keen eye to find the remnants of the missile systems. At least in Addison, Illinois, there's a place to take a breather, even if at one time that place was ready for nuclear war. And I've got to wonder if former launch sites of atomic weapons can be converted into spaces for children and it's common knowledge. What are the mysteries that we don't know about? I'll leave it there for today, but thank you for watching. This is Ryan Sokash, signing off.